Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 161 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. Four seasons in one week, swarms that refuse to stay, being picked on by stinging bees and a spring honey crop that's disappearing fast. So much to enjoy in this beekeeper's world. Beekeeping Short and Sweet, a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this week's podcast. They say we're obsessed by the weather. Well, I'm beginning to think I may well be. As a side note, I'm writing this at 5am and the sun is shining, the skies are blue, there's not a cloud to be seen at the moment, and you'd wonder what all the fuss has been about, but it's been a week of thunderstorms, hailstorms, rain showers, intense heat from late spring sunshine, and a case of dashing over to hives to inspect before dashing back again to the truck to shelter from the sudden and very heavy downpours. The stupid thing is, I stand looking at the sky, seeing the dark clouds heading my way, knowing that the rain is falling. You can see it, there's so much coming my way. Yet, I act surprised when it suddenly drops from the sky, muttering and complaining to myself. I've been hurriedly closing up hives and jumping back into the truck, there waiting for the rain to stop, and a chance to resume inspections. During one inspection, we could actually hear the rumbling of thunder, something not to be messed with, particularly as most of us hold a shiny metal hive tool in our hands for most of the inspections. So thunder in the background, camera equipment recording video, and then the heavens open with giant hailstones. Time to dash back to the truck again and wait it out. Before long, the felt-covered roof of a dilapidated shed is starting to steam again as the sun boils off the water, and the bees, who were as suddenly quiet, resume flights back and forth to the oilseed rape field. That particular crop is almost gone for me now, somewhat disappointing as my colonies for the most part struggle to get any amount stored away as honey. Not a big deal if you're a hobbyist beekeeper with a couple of hives in the back garden, but if your livelihood depends upon it, there may be less on the table this year. Of course, the honey is there for the bees. Food stored away when there's a surplus for use in leaner times, and boy, have they been working through it this spring. One week, there's an almost full super of honey. The next, it's pretty much all gone. Colonies are large right now, Brood nest areas have been growing and larvae needs feeding. And that, of course, is regardless of the weather outside. In case you've missed it, colonies have also been swarming. I've managed to lose a few, prevent a few, and also, almost unbelievably, collect just one. The very changeable weather this spring has made it a little more difficult to clip queens, resulting in them joining the rest of the swarm in heading over the hedge and across the fields into the distance. Exactly that happened this week. Steph and I arrived at one of our apiaries to see a large cloud of bees, apparently in total disarray, settle into a hawthorn bush, a possible swarm catcher, I thought. But no, within minutes of settling, they departed a dark cloud of bees disappearing across a farmer's field, looking to all the world as if they had somewhere very specific to be, and going there in a bit of a hurry. Oh well, lesson learnt, I hope. As we prepared to start inspections, another colony started to spill out of a hive entrance, this time clustering on the front of the hive. Another swarm about to leave, no doubt. What to do then in this situation? Well, as I've said before, Think of a colony as three component parts, the queen, the brood, and the flying bees. If you can separate one from the other two, you stand a chance of preventing a swarm. Let's face it, if you take out the queen, the flying bees have no one to head up the new colony if they decide to leave, so why bother? This then is my first course of action. Have a very quick look for the queen, Not so easy when the bees are massing on the front of the hive, and at this apiary particularly, there's no room for moving the hive to another stand, 
and replacing it with an empty box in an artificial swarm kind of move. Add to the fact I was out of any usable hive parts to do this anyway, and we had to move fast. A search through the brood box revealed sealed swarm queen cells, those perfectly formed queen cells that run along the bottom of a brood frame. These bees were ready to go and were obviously waiting for final departure instructions as we arrived. A second pass through the brood box, this time in reverse order, by that I mean I work forwards through the brood box frame by frame as I normally would. I have my hive set up in the cold way, frames perpendicular to the entrance. Anyway, I work across the brood box and then, rather than starting with the first frame again, I simply come back working from the far side, that's frame number 12 or 11, back to frame number 2, frame 1 being taken out to give more room for the inspection. I digress as usual, but at this point I'm seeing no eggs or very young larvae, so these bees are very keen to get going. Frame 7, or thereabouts, and there's the queen, on a frame of sealed brood. This one is clipped, maybe they've already had a try at swarming and she made it back into the hive. But now it's decision time, what are we going to do? Well, we have a few nuke boxes on the truck, so let's simply remove the queen and leave them with just one queen cell. But why would I do that? What's the effect of doing this? And is it the right thing to do in this situation? Well, removing the queen immediately prevents some swarming, so that's one box ticked. Removing all the queen cells except one means they won't swarm when the new queen emerges. It's the reason I don't leave any more than one queen cell, so that's another box ticked. I won't lose all the flying bees. The foragers who are currently attempting to store nectar as honey, and with a little luck, fill a box or two for me. And all the emerging brood will boost the colony into a fine foraging honey production colony as we head into the summer, with no sudden loss of size destroying what I hope I have of a honey crop from them for the rest of the season. That's a lot of boxes ticked for me, and it makes a lot of sense, and in my mind is good beekeeping husbandry. If you want to split the colony for an increase, you could also do that. So, as in so many cases in beekeeping, your individual situation will dictate what and why you should be doing the things that you do. Just make sure you have a plan in mind when you do it. So, the queen went into a nuke box with a frame of sealed brood, the one she was on, a frame of food, and a couple of frames of bees shaken off other frames to give her some support going forward. I now have a nuke that can grow through the rest of the year and a backup queen should the queen cell that I left fail for whatever reason. Job done. It doesn't always work out so swimmingly though. I've been battling with the colony in the top bar hive for four weeks now. A war of attrition, if you like. The bees finally won this week and swarmed. I've been managing to remove swarm cells, week in, week out, delaying them for as long as I could. But this week, a combination of weather and other commitments meant I missed a day and inspected them eight days after the previous inspection. And of course, they saw it as a chance to swarm and were off. They certainly had enough swarm cells. I lost count after a while, but managed to record a video so hopefully some kind soul out there will count them up for me and let me know. The upshot was I couldn't find the queen. I'm guessing she's long gone, and I couldn't remember if she was clipped or not, but there certainly seemed to be plenty of bees in the hive, so maybe she was clipped. But the top bars make it quite tricky to inspect without mishandling the comb and seeing it snap off, something I've only done once this season so far, but it's always in the back of my mind when I'm inspecting. This means I don't have the focus or ability to get a really good look at the comb as I would with a standard frame and more likely to miss seeing the queen. There were some cracking queen cells in the colony though and I decided it was time to attempt to split, particularly as Pete had so kindly put a raft of entrances in at the sides of the top bar hive body so we could try splitting them. In a long hive, such as a top bar hive, it's a very simple process. Move any number of top bars to either end of the hive, stick a division or follower board in between them, and that's it really. And of course, remembering to remove all but one of the queen cells on either side of the split. The actual split was a little uneven in terms of 
top bars either side of the division board. I really wanted to see if they would produce a small excess of honey that we could remove. And so I guess I gave the smaller split maybe four or five top bars. I can't quite remember, so I'll have to update you next time. They had lots of bees, but of course the flying bees will return to the original entrance and rejoin the main colony. So here I'm hoping I've created a new queen in both sides, have a top bar hive split creating two colonies, and the addition of a headache as I'm really not sure what I'll do if both queens successfully emerge, mate and start to lay. We don't have another top bar hive, so perhaps we'll use one of the queens to start off a nuke in a box somewhere and work out how to unite the two parts back into one colony. Watch this space as they say. Moving on, here's a funny topic and one we encountered again this week. I say a funny topic, but it's only really funny if you're the one person that's not on the receiving end. Why do bees sometimes sting one person and not another? Quite a number of years ago, and I think I've mentioned this before, but a number of years ago we were out queen rearing and I had both Steph and my brother along to lend a hand. After a short while of moving boxes, opening hives, checking queen cells and the like, my brother let out a yelp having been stung on the head. A few chuckles and back to work. Another yelp, same person, same location, and another, and another. This finally ending in him going rogue, throwing down his tools and heading back to the truck. Steph and I seemingly untouched by the bees. Fast forward and this week the same thing, only this time it's Steph being stung. Pretty much every time she held her hand out to either pick up the smoker or to use the smoker to try and calm some of the bees in the colony. Eventually, and something like seven or eight stings later, I was left alone with the smoker to finish off the inspections, totally untouched by the bees. It's really weird, and it doesn't help that the unaffected beekeeper always finds it funny. Obviously, it's not funny, and after making my apologies, we resumed inspections at another apiary where the bees were not at all intent on stinging either of us. You might think it's perhaps the fault of shampoo or deodorant or too much garlic on the pizza the night before, but then why only one or two colonies out of something around 30? Another of life's little beekeeping mysteries. No doubt I'll fall victim to these colonies in due course, have the smile wiped off my face, and of course be reminded of the time I wasn't quite so sympathetic. Finally this week, absconding swarms. I've had a couple of conversations this past week or so with beekeepers who've taken some considerable time to chase a swarm or two around the garden and into neighbours' property, gently coaxing them into a cardboard box, usually by vigorously shaking a branch, but managing to get the queen and settling them into said box, followed up by a quick slam dunk into a brood box or else marvelling at watching the bees run up a board into the front entrance of a beehive, a trick that still warms the heart even after so many years of doing it, excitedly checking on the hive the following day, only to find that for some reason every last bee has disappeared, well almost every bee, there's usually one or two left, no doubt, puzzling as to where everyone has gone as much as the beekeeper. And it's such a disappointment at this stage. You've worked hard to get them secured from the branch or bush, spent ages making sure everything is set up, only for them to apparently disappear without a trace. Absconding is a big pain, wasting time and effort, and resulting in no return for the beekeeper. I'm really not sure why they do it though, Sometimes I've made the mistake of trying to get a prime swarm into a small nuke box and it's fairly obvious that they're not going to stay, but in the absence of a bigger box or hive, it's all that you have at hand. I generally leave the scene with a feeling of impending doom and sure enough, by the time I've returned, they're gone. I've actually taken to making sure there's some very fresh wax in the hive that I'm introducing them into, sometimes actually melting some wax with my lighter for the smoker in order to get a really strong smell of wax going. And as yet, I've not lost a swarm using this method, but then I've only had sight of one so far this season, and sometimes there seems no reason at all why they wouldn't be happy. It's just puzzling and frustrating. Never mind, there'll be another swarm along any day now, so all's not lost. Remember, a podcast subscription will get you the very latest tips and techniques from me each week as they're released, 
As things stand, it's going to cost less than a couple of Starbucks coffees. And remember, that's drive through prices. Head over to my Patreon page and sign up to my Podcast Plus tier for the very latest beekeeping chat and an occasional joke or two. They may be not so funny, but anyway, the tips and techniques are worth every penny. That's it for this week. I'll catch up with you all again next time, but for now, I'm Stuart Spinks, and that was Beekeeping Short and Sweet. Bye.